Good afternoon, and welcome to AIADA's Auto Talk. I'm your host, Rachel Soleimani. Before we get started, a few quick reminders as always. Anyone who has registered for today's program will be receiving a copy by early next week. And if you have any questions, be sure to enter them into the Q&A bar at the lower right-hand side of your interface. Today, we welcome friends from Bank of America, Marissa Carnavali henderson Senior Vice President and Market Executive, and Jacob Lerner, Bank of America Securities. Marissa and Jake, I know you have a lot to cover today, so I'll let you take it away. Fantastic, Rachel, thank you. And good morning to our West Coast attendees and good afternoon to everyone else. As Rachel mentioned, I am Marissa Carnavali henderson and I am the market executive for the dealer financial services business for the East region. Also joining me today is my colleague, Jake Lerner, with Bank of America Securities. Jake advises our clients on interest rate strategies. We're delighted to be back with you to provide an update on the overall economy and specifically on the interest rate market. Before I turn it over to Jake and specifically for those who were not at the spring meeting in Washington, I would like to share a few quick highlights of our dealer financial services business. We are a national practice organized into two regions, the East and the West, and a national practice. We are the largest non-captive financial provider to the automotive space, spanning 90 plus years of uninterrupted service. Our team of 44 relationship managers throughout the country deliver customized financial solutions to our clients and prospects, including all the traditional solutions such as floor plan, real estate, working capital, and acquisition financing. Additionally, we are proud to be recognized as an industry leader in the public debt and equity capital markets arena, as well as access to broad investor base for privately held debt or equity, equity capital raising. With that, it is my pleasure to turn it over to Jake Lerner to provide an update on the interest rate market. Jake, I'll turn it over to you. Thank you, Marissa. And thank you everyone at the AIADA for having us today. Um, as Mar Marissa uh, introduced me, I am the uh, interest rate risk management advisor for most of the dealership clients that we cover across the United States. Um, I also advise uh, various other clients in different sectors from an interest rate and foreign exchange perspective. Um, so thank you again for having us. And uh, it is a timely, it is a timely discussion, given that we've had some uh, meaningful economic data over the last week with inflation and, and a Federal Reserve meeting tomorrow where the Fed is expected to announce um, an interest rate decision on their, their Fed funds rate. So um, without further ado, I am going to set the stage for where we are today and um, the potential outcomes for where we might be going forward, um, incorporating some of E of A researches, views, and uh, commentary. So, um, looking back a year uh, and a half now, looking back to March of, of 2022, the Fed started hiking uh, very rapidly from what was uh, basically zero percent interest rates um, following the pandemic in order to support the economy, um, given all of the um, all, all of the financial and economic issues caused by the COVID crisis. Um, the Fed started hiking very quickly um, in larger increments than we normally see, uh, all the way up to right now uh, where we're at, at 5.25% to 5.50%. Uh, the main driver behind that was uh, decades high inflation uh, that still is persisting and remains sticky. Um, compared to where we have been over the last 20 to, to 40 years, really. Um, so tomorrow, the Fed is expected to keep rates on hold uh, and keep their Fed funds rate between the five and a quarter to five and a half percentage uh, range. Um, and uh, BVA then expects one more hike in November. 
um, to get to a final terminal rate of five and a half to five and three quarter percentage points. Uh, the market isn't quite pricing that in fully. The market's pricing in only a 30% chance. Um, however, in order to curb inflation, the Fed has hinted that they may need to raise rates further. Um, while the market is largely pricing in a pause in line with BNA's expectations at the next meeting, um, a, a clear indicator will be their summary of economic projections that they release every other meeting where the various FOMC members uh, display where they see the Fed funds rate over the next uh, over the next three years. Um, so what is that meant for borrowing rates and term rates, uh, such as mortgages and um, where many of our dealer clients borrow? It's meant elevated borrowing costs, um, especially for those who have not hedged. Um, and for consumers and home buyers, it's meant higher mortgage rates than we've seen over the last um, over the last thirty to forty years. Um, so, what what might happen going going forward, and and where are the various outcomes? Well, <clears throat> this slide shows the market projection of the Fed in the uh, on the dot plot I just mentioned on the dark blue line, compared to B of A's forecast on the dotted line up top. Uh, versus what the market is pricing in. And when I say what the market is pricing in, I mean um, where basically various trading uh, traders across the street are pricing in interest rates to be at various points. Um, this, this shows that the market is pricing in cuts starting in the spring, uh, while the Fed is pricing in a cut starting in the summer of 2024 of next year. Um, I think that the summary here is that there is um, there is, while the market is pricing in cuts, there is a risk of rates to stay higher for longer in order to battle the high inflation that we've been that I, that I mentioned earlier. Um, so the market is pricing in a, a longer term rate of um, around three and a half percent, looking out to 2020, uh, 2025. Uh, that's in line with B of A's forecast. However, um, we've heard Fed Chair Powell and some of the other uh, FOMC members at various points say they will do what, whatever is necessary, including having the economy, um, the economy and the housing industry um, falter slightly uh, in order to curb this inflation. Um, and we haven't seen that happen quite yet. So um, for all of those that were at the presentation in, in the spring, I showed this slide talking about how um, when inflation hits developed economies, uh, it's, it, it takes decades, usually on average, uh, to bring the inflation levels back down to earth to around the 2% inflation target that um, both the U.S. Fed Reserve and, and many other central banks have, have targeted historically. Um, and we've really only seen this inflation persist in our economy for uh for about uh, a year and a half now. Um, so uh, I thought this slide was, was pretty interesting. I put together a look back on uh, headline and core inflation compared to the uh, overnight interest rates over the last 45 years, and then took a, a little bit of a deeper dive into a four-year look back. Um, to take a one step back, headline inflation is uh, our basket CPI uh, consumer price index for the United States, taking into account everything, uh, including food and uh, energy costs, such as gasoline and oil and such, uh, whereas core extracts food and energy. Um, so the reason we, we look at core is because it is typically a little less volatile than food and energy, given that those specific uh, inputs are um, more sensitive on a seasonal and a, and a monthly basis. But um, I think the highlight here is that uh, historically, looking back, inflation is still very, very elevated. While core, while headline inflation has come down to uh, 3.7 percent from a high of 9.1 percent, um, core inflation has remained sticky um, and it is still elevated. Most recently, printing at 4.3 uh, percent. Um, that's still over two percentage points away from the Fed's inflation target. Now, 
they have stated that they will uh, be targeting a flexible average inflation target, uh, meaning that they're not just looking at 2%, but they're looking at more of a range. But um, by all measures, we're still, um, if you're looking at a 2 to 2.5% two range, we're still uh, 1.8 to 2. Uh, 2, 2. Uh, Two percent away from that, those two point three percent away from those levels. Um, so, in order for that to happen, uh, we're going to have to see the Fed keep rates higher uh, at least until the, the spring and potentially longer. Um, and we're also going to have to see uh, the consumer slow down um, and employment slow down, um, which we haven't quite seen yet. We've still seen very strong job data in the most recent non-farm payrolls. Um, and we've also seen uh, strong consumer data, both in the recent retail sales, printing higher than expected, um, but also in uh, our B of A's uh, card data, which I'll talk about on the next slide. Um, but when we're thinking about where the Fed might need inflation to be to start cutting, it's not at 2%, but it needs to be trending down toward that level. Um, at a fairly meaningful pace, which, again, we, we've seen in the headline numbers, but not quite in the um, in the core figures. Um, so, touching on um, some of the the consumer side, um, one uh, the card data, and this is all actually B of A data, so it is a. a limited data set compared to the uh, economic data that the that the government publishes because the government is going to encompass um, most U.S. consumers, whereas B of A only has visibility into um, into on the top our card data and on the bottom um, the United States citizens that have uh, consumer accounts with B of A. But um, I do find it as a fairly uh, influential and interesting data point to show um, that the consumer credit card data has been pretty in line with um, where the uh, national retail sales and, and consumer growth has been. So, um, as you can see on the on the top left, we've seen credit card spending come down and come in over the last two years. However, um, it, it's kind of flattened out. Um, even since the Fed has risen rates to very high levels, um, we can see that both um, on both on retail and services, indicated by both of these um, credit card spending tables here. Um, but what I find is maybe more uh, of the impactful uh, data is the savings and the median household um, savings across the different income levels. So on the bottom, this charts out the monthly median household savings and checking balances. Um, again, this is in B of A deposit accounts, but um, I think it's a fairly helpful indicator across the American consumer. And you can see here that um, basically, while we have seen household savings come in relative to the highs that uh, occurred during COVID, right? Those highs, as you can see, are more impactful for uh, lower income uh, families due to the fact that they receive the bulk of the fiscal stimulus. But nonetheless, all of the levels still remain elevated and appear to be decreasing at um, not as rapid of a, of a clip as one would expect given the one high interest rates, which likely the entire uh, loan payments on interest. Um, and essentially less less income coming in. Obviously, we have seen more folks flock to the job market, and um, we have seen more folks flock to the job market and, um, and, and look for supplemental income following the removal of um, fiscal stimulus. However, if you look back to 2019, when um, before the pandemic and before all the fiscal stimulus, um, we're, we're well away from that level. Um, so there's a long ways to go, um, so it's, and it's going to be a combination of the 
correct, the, the consumer spending, consumer health, but also really um, how much money the consumer has, how safe one feels um, in order for uh, all of the inflation and um, also the, the jobs market to, to slow down um, and trickle into the broader economy. Um, so with that being said, there's still a lot of uncertainty going forward. Um, and I think all of this shows that um, while the Fed might not hike much further, um, again, BVA calling for another 25 basis point hike, um, other banks calling for a pause, um, th- there's a likelihood and a possibility that rates stay higher for longer in order to curb um, this inflation and high spending driving the inflation. So um, lastly, I wanted to touch on what some folks, uh, specifically in the dealer space, are looking at in order to protect themselves against this uncertainty. Um, in terms of interest rate protection and, and clients with floating rate debt, um, typically the most common hedging instrument is an interest rate swap uh, that's used to fix floating rate debt um, and have a known stream of interest payments. Um, well, given the uncertainty going forward and the possibility for the Fed to cut, um, fairly soon based on market projections, uh, folks want a better ability to be able to participate in lower rates, but also have the upside protection in the case that the Fed uh, does not cut soon or um, actually continues to hike. Um, and that's what a color does. It basically creates a range of outcomes, a top side worst case and a bottom side best case for um, for interest rate protection. Um, so these would be completely customized to an individual's capital structure and specific loan that they're looking to hedge. Um, but uh, I think it's helpful to just see that you can basically lock in levels below where floating rates are. This is one month term so far on the bottom right at 5.32% in between the Fed's 5.25% and 5.5% uh, uh, Fed funds target rate, um, while you can lock in a, a cap strike on the collar below that level um, and still get somewhere between a percentage point and a percentage point 1.6% um, of participation should the Fed cut. Um, so this is something that more and more clients have looked at uh, in order to get protection on their rising interest rates understand better um, where their interest payments uh, might be over the, the near to medium term, um, but also still get some participation in the case that rates ultimately do uh, go lower if the Fed cuts. So um, with that, I can see if there's any questions and uh, hopefully, hopefully talk more about what's going on with the interest rate environment. Marissa and Jake, thanks so much for joining us today. If anyone has any questions for Jake, you can email them to me, and I will pass them along. Marissa and Jake, I know you guys are both busy, especially in this ever-changing environment. So just thank you both again for coming on and meeting with us today. Again, you will all be receiving a copy of this webinar by early next week. Join us back here on Tuesday, October 3rd, as Podium discusses how to use AI to find and win more car buyers. So be on the lookout for promotions on how to register. For more information about AIADA, visit AIADA.org. Thanks for tuning in and have a great day, everyone.